So we're thinking now about the clinical features in heart failure. And on this side, this person has got mostly left heart failure. And on this side, this person has got mostly right heart failure. But of course, in more established cases of heart failure, it can be difficult to tell the difference between right and left failure because both ventricles fail. We get bilateral heart failure. But let's think first about the uh, jugular venous pressure. Now we get the patient to turn their head to the right and we look at the jugular veins in the neck here. And if the jugular venous pressure is increased, that is a sign of heart failure. And this is particularly prominent in someone with right heart failure. We tend to get very prominent jugular veins, increased jugular venous pressure. You can get it as well in patients that are predominantly left heart failure but usually very predominant in patients with, with right heart failure. Now, cardiomegaly is another feature. The heart normally doesn't occupy more than half of the diameter of the chest. So if the heart's increased from its normal size, that's the cardiomegaly. And that's predominantly a feature of left heart failure. The workload of the left ventricle is increased. There's a left ventricular hypertrophy. There's an increase in the size of the individual cardiac myocytes and we get this overall enlarged heart. Very obvious on chest x-rays. Now also, mostly in left heart failure, we get pulmonary edema. So the lungs of course are going to be here. And pulmonary edema is the accumulation of fluid in the lung fields, causing difficulty in breathing. And because of the increased back pressure in left heart failure, we can also get um, pleural effusion sometimes as well. Now the difference between the difference between these two is that the pulmonary edema the fluid is in the interstitial spaces in the lungs and collects in the alveoli. In a pleural effusion, the fluid collects in the pleural space. The potential pleural space becomes an actual pleural space as fluid collects between the visceral and the parietal pleural membrane. Now, hepatomegaly is enlargement of the liver and this is predominantly a feature of right heart failure. So the liver's here. And in right heart failure, the liver becomes congested. There's fluid accumulation in the liver, congestion of the liver. And that causes the liver to get bigger. There's a hepatomegaly as a feature of right heart failure. And also in right heart failure, because of the backlog of pressure in the systemic veins. Of course, here we have the uh, peritoneal sac containing the, the viscera, the abdominal organs. And fluid can accumulate due to the venous back pressure in the peritoneal sac. And if fluid accumulates in the peritoneal sac, we call that ascites, accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal sac in the, in the abdomen. And of course, a classic feature in heart failure is pitting edema, pitting edema. When we press, there's a finger mark left in the, in wherever, wherever we've pressed. <laughs> Now, uh, in right heart failure, the legs can become very swollen because of the back pressure in the systemic veins. Indeed, the legs can swell all the way up with pitting edema. Now, we do get pitting edema in uh, predominantly left heart failure as well, but classically it will be uh, less pronounced and probably affecting more the ankle region. Whereas in right heart failure, it can affect more of the legs they become very edematous.
the edema is uh, dependent, that means it depends on gravity. So if the patient's lying in bed, um, the fluid can accumulate in the sacral areas, for example. So let's try and explain why we get these features. And to do that, we go back to our hopefully now reasonably familiar diagram of the systemic and the pulmonary circulation, the systemic circulation on this side, the pulmonary circulation on, on, the, uh, on that side going to the lungs. Now, first of all, if there's left ventricular failure, so there's reduced pumping efficiency of the left ventricle, what's going to happen here is that the fluid is not going to be discharged adequately from the left ventricle. So there's going to be residual volume in the left ventricle. That makes it harder for the blood to get from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So the blood dams back up there and the blood is damming back, as we've seen in previous videos, into the lungs. So we get damming back into the lungs. So this explains quite nicely the cardiomegaly because the cardiomegaly is caused by the increased left ventricular workload and the hypertrophy. But you can see now we've got increased back pressure in the lungs, there's congestion in the lungs because of the impaired left ventricular failure. And that's what causes the development of the pulmonary edema and the increased back pressure can also lead to pleural effusions. Now we have mentioned that we get the pitting edema and we get some raised jugular venous pressure in left ventricular failure. But that's because the circulation backlogs all the way round. And we'll, we'll go through that again in a minute. But first let's look at the features of, of right heart failure, particularly. So in, in right heart failure, this failure of the, this time failure of the right ventricular myocardium, which is here. So the right ventricular myocardium. Now, if the right ventricular myocardium is not working properly, there's going to be incomplete emptying of the right ventricle after systole, after cardiac contraction. That's going to damn the blood back into the right atrium. And it's the systemic veins that drain into the right atrium. So the blood's going to damn back, particularly into the systems of the body into the systems of the body. And of course, in the body, we have the abdominal cavity and the, the abdominal viscera. We have the peritoneum with its very large capillary blood supply. And when the pressure in the mesenteric capillaries supplying and draining the gastrointestinal tract is increased, that's what can cause the ascites. So the ascites is caused by the raise pressure in the systemic veins. And the same is true of the hepatomegaly. So the liver, of course, is part of the body, just the same way as the gastrointestinal tract and the mesenteric blood supply and blood drainage is part of the body. So the liver becomes very congested with blood. The liver can't drain properly. So because the backlog of pressure is affecting the systemic veins, the pressure in the veins draining the liver is increased because the blood can't flow away into the larger systemic veins. That's going to increase the pressure in the liver capillaries, and that's going to cause the enlargement of the, of the liver, the hepatomegaly. And over time, of course, that's going to damage the liver. The pitting edema, well, of course, the legs are part of the body. So if there's a backlog of blood in the body, the blood is not going to drain adequately from the legs. That's going to increase the pressure of the blood in the capillaries in the legs. That's going to re reduce the reabsorption of tissue fluid. So much more tissue fluid is going to be left. And as we say, that's dependent. It will just go where the gravity is. But very often it leads to fairly pronounced pitting edema in the legs in predominantly right ventricular failure left ventricular failure 
to a somewhat lesser extent. So that sort of explains these main classical features of the, um, the right and left heart failure. But let's just take the example of a left heart failure now to show the way this can dam back through the entire circulatory system. So we've got left ventricular failure here. That's not working properly. So the blood's going to dam back into the left ventricle, the left atrium, the pulmonary veins and into the lungs. And the, that means the left ventricular failure will lead to lung congestion. So the lungs are going to be congested. Now, if the lungs are already congested and full, is that going to make it harder or easier for blood to get into the lungs? Well, I think you can see it's going to make it harder because the lungs are already full. So that's going to mean that we have an increased pressure in the pulmonary artery. And if the pressure in the pulmonary artery is increased because of this congestion in the lungs, that's going to increase right ventricular workload. The right ventricle is going to have to work harder. So there'll be a right ventricular hypertrophy to try and compensate. There'll be an increase in the size of the cardiac myocytes, but of course we know that also leads to fibrosis and to failure. So over time there'll be a right ventricular failure. So left ventricular failure will lead to right ventricular failure. And very often these tend to present together because these can develop slowly over years. And if there's a right ventricular failure, we know that that leads to these particular features. So the, the increase in jugular venous pressure and the pitting edema, although they are features of right heart failure, we do see them in left heart failure because left heart failure also causes right heart failure. So that diagram is actually explaining why we get these classical features of right and left heart failure.